Hello, everybody. I'm just going to give a, a, a quick wave to our team in the background. We've had um, a couple of technical difficulties, which I thought we were well past the day of days of in doing these things. Um, but a couple of laptops that did the dreaded Windows update about 20 minutes before we got started. But I think we're ready to go unless anyone in my team frantically waves and says otherwise. Um, we'll get started so we don't lose any more of your time. So welcome to Discover Set Squared. Uh, so my name is Marty Reid. I'm the director of the programme and it's a genuine pleasure to be guiding you through this session today. Now, in my role, I tend to spend most of my time looking ahead to the strategy, the funding, economic impact of our wider programme. But what really gets me excited what I do, and I think it's shared amongst the whole team, is the chance to work with founders and entrepreneurs looking to bring amazing technology into the world and grow really amazing companies. Um, and that's why this session is so important for us. A couple of times a year, we get the chance to reach out, engage, and meet the next generation of entrepreneurs who are looking to build great companies with their technology and to make real, um, real societal or economic impact in the world. So I'm delighted and genuinely privileged that so many of you have given up your time to join us today, and hopefully you'll get to discover that the Set Square program is right for you to make that impact that you're looking to do. So uh, over the next uh, 55 minutes or so, uh, I'll be kicking off and I'll be taking you through a whistle-stop tour of the shape of the programme, what we do, what we deliver, what's included, and some examples and case studies of impact is made before with entrepreneurs and founders like yourselves. Then for a bit of a deeper dive, uh, we'll get some insight from Rick Chapman, who's our entrepreneur and one of our entrepreneurs in residence, um, who's a real heart of the programme in terms of offering coaching to the founders and share some experience of that role. Uh, we'll have uh, Will Britton from Autonomy. You don't just want to hear from us. Uh, Will is the founder of a successful business who's gone through the Set Squared program, and he'll share a bit about his experience and what he got from working with us. And then finally, we'll have a good bit of time for a QA and a because, you know, in the wide spectrum of the kind of work you're doing, I'm sure there'll be questions that uh, we won't have answered. So we'll have a good bit of time for open Q&A, and everyone who's speaking will, will join us and have uh, speak through. So without further ado, what are we all about? Fundamentally, Set Squared Bristol is about growing global tech businesses out of Bristol. For a bit of wider context, we are part of the University of Bristol family. So that means that our roots, our heritage, um, and an awful lot of connectivity we have is with the breadth of talent and resources from across the institution, in particular reaching back into the research and technology pipelines that exist across academic networks that um, drive and create so much of the innovation that goes on to, to form amazing startups and scale ups. But crucially, we are not an academic led team. You know, our team run as a business ourselves with a profit and loss, and we deliver commercial services to businesses. Um, and it's a really important distinction. While lots of our you know, great talent and businesses that have gone through Set Squared have come out of universities, all from lots of different places in the UK and further afield, actually the majority of businesses we work with and support are tend to be from a commercial background of all kinds of experience, sectors, uh, and ages and sources. In Set Square Bristol, we're also part of a wider partnership. Now, while we run our programme independently, um, we have access to and engage with a wider network of other incubators and centres that operate from Cardiff all the way down the West Coast and hooking around to Surrey and Southampton. Now, that means that members who work in our programme have access to a much wider network of peers and we have access to resources, networks from industry and investors in a much wider landscape than uh, an incubator based out of one city region. And finally, we have our home of the program in Engine Shed. So Engine Shed is an enterprise hub based in the heart of Bristol. And the program is based there. You don't have to be based there to be on the program yourself. Most of our members aren't, but all members have access to facility. And on any given day, our lounge will involve and have people from academia, 
entrepreneurs, industry, regional government. It's a real melting pot of innovation and talent. And as members, you get access to that community and the rich program of events at the same time. But growing, growing global tech businesses, it's quite a claim, I know. So to give a little bit of context and background um, for the impact that companies have gone through our programs have made to stand behind that claim, I just want to pick out a couple of examples um, of what it looks like uh, in the whole. So we've been running this program for just over 10 years. It's transformed, it's grown, and it's evolved. But We've now worked with over 300 companies in that time, and they've collectively raised over 600 million in funding from grants through to venture capital in various rounds. And that's not a historic thing. In the last three years alone, as it says on this slide, we worked with over 100 companies, raising nearly 200 in investment. Now, investment isn't the be all and end all of growing it, ventures and enterprises. And so it's exciting that that's then also uh, transformed into business growth and success significant revenues in the last three years, over 100 million, hundreds of jobs created, and we're really proud of the high survival rate of startups going through our program, given the really challenging areas they work in. And the second point in terms of impact is our approach in terms of collaborating, both on the national scale and locally, particularly to make our programs accessible and inclusive and to make a wider social impact than just say for the elite working in the tech sector. A couple of case studies, we work with NatWest on our Enterprising Women program, I'll talk about a little bit later on. And then we work with great community organizations like ACH, like Babasa, to make sure that the work we do can resonate and create benefits for the local economy and local communities in the city around us. And we have had recognized and delighted to be recognized for the success and track record in the program. Uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, we were voted the hottest accelerator in Europe at the Europas. We were shortlisted last year again, just fell a little bit short in terms of winning two years in a row. And just this week, we've heard that we're shortlisted for an award for the Southwest in terms of our commitment to diversity and inclusion. But I guess all those numbers, the, you know, the accolades, all of that is actually about the story of our members and just reflect, reflects what the companies have been doing. Now, I know to uh, many of you, these names will be uh, just logos on a slide to our team. We know the people behind them, but to give you a bit of a flavor of the companies that have gone through the program and how broad it is, we have Lockbox. They're a fintech who are specialist and are focusing on helping people build credit ratings with a huge customer base in the US now. Uh, Condensed Reality, now renamed Condense, they've got leading technology and volumetric video. Uh, that's very applicable in the creative technology sector and real pillar of making the metaverse move on to its next generation. Or at the other end, we have um, Let Us Grow, uh, who have leading technology in vertical farming. And in between that, we have companies working in life sciences and health technology and 5G and telco. All that to say that whatever background you have, whatever IP and technology area, you're likely to have a peer in the scope of a program and will likely have an experience of working with you. But the common thing that holds them together is wanting to make a tangible positive impact through their work and their technology. And as I said, for us, the technologies, the businesses are exciting, but really for us, um, the pr underlying principle of our program is working with the founders. Uh, this picture always makes me smile. Um, this is Joanne. She leads a company called Include, who won the Tech Expo pitching competition uh, that we ran earlier in the year, our big annual showcase uh, for a few hundred people in the centre of Bristol. And it's those little stories and, and those moments that really matter to us. Because we do think our program is a bit different and ultimately we're here to help founders succeed underlying all of the numbers and everything else and how we do that and why our program's a little bit different has three main principles firstly the program itself is actually bespoke so unlike uh 
you know, an accelerator program where you're almost expected to come in on day one looking a bit like one thing and pop out in 12 weeks time looking something different. I think our experience over the last decade is that you're all different. You've all got different levels of experience. You've come from industry. You might have come from research. They might, you might have no business experience at all. So how could one size fix up, fit all? So our program, and I'll explain how we manage this next, is actually designed to give you all a bespoke experience that fills the gaps that you need um, worked on at any point in time. And the duration is flexible as a result. We actually have companies staying with us for an average of a couple of years, leaning in and out of the programme when they need it most. Secondly, an underlying principle is that it's accessible and not just in the spectrum of different technologies and backgrounds that are mentioned, but a core principle is that it's accessible and inclusive to anyone irrespective of um, their background. Uh, we've worked really, really hard over quite a number of years to uh, make improvements in this area from a point when our programme was representative of the wider tech sector, i.e. pretty terrible in terms of um, representation uh, of different people. Uh, and a couple of case studies of that are we worked with a number of external partners to carry out research on the barriers to individuals from different backgrounds getting access to and being successful in incubation and acceleration programs like ours. That's led to interventions like the Breakthrough Bursary, which provides additional support for people um, of our founders of minority ethnic backgrounds, and also Enterprising Women, which is supported by NatWest, which is a pre-incubator delivering incubation, business support, and quality coaching in a flexible manner at an earlier stage for women who have an idea stage business or a side hustle to give them a much clearer pathway and inspiration into running a business or becoming an entrepreneur. And now just a reference point of what that's delivered, even though we're gonna still keep working on it, 45% of the companies um, in the program right now are founded by women. And finally, as the numbers shown, for us, it's all about impact impact in technology, impact in society, impact to create jobs, and for companies to go on to grow and survive. And we're constantly monitoring, tracking that to improve it. So what's actually involved underneath? What's underneath the hood? What would you be getting and what do we deliver? So our program is based around delivering against five incubation topics. There's a lot of detail underneath them, um, but at a high level, they're organized by what we've, our experience are, is the barriers and challenges that startups face when trying to establish and grow. Effectively, the full spectrum of gaps that any individual could have when you're trying to build a company, no one has it all from day one. And they're around product, organization, funding, market, and finally, the personal development of the founder themselves. It's not a normal job. You shouldn't consider it as one. And it's one something that people can learn, get experience of, and be taught. So we have a real focus on founders being at the heart and getting personal development as well. And if you bear those five areas in mind, then we then deliver interventions and support across in three different layers. The first, the wraparound of it all, is our community and network. This is a series of events, our connect events for meeting with peers, meeting with industrial partners, meeting with the network in the city and way and beyond. Showcases, investor engagement opportunities, all about broadening who you can engage with to help get experience and for your business to grow, whether it's customers, mentors, um, people for boards. We then have themed forums around specific market sectors that there's large clusters in. For example, there's a real thriving digital health cluster in the city. So we've worked with the founders and industry partners to put on regular meetups for that community to get together and share experience. That's all supported by a really wide network of members of mentors who provide support and engage to help the companies. And then some practical things. Um, a big one being discounted tools and software. There's a whole list of them I wouldn't remember, but to give you a flavor, it's business tools like 90% um, off of a HubSpot subscription, um, $25,000 worth of Amazon Web Service credits, and a year, uh, if you're a more technical company, to a lot of Siemens suite of uh, software tools. Those things that when you're setting up as a startup, you could really do with being a bit more affordable and accessible, and you get that through the program. 
The next layer in is focused on skills and training for the founders, but also as you grow your business, get your employees two, three, four, five, um, your marketing, your comms, your finance, skills and training for that whole team. Again, based around product, market, funding, organization, and founder. Now, there's 50 through the year, and not everyone needs all of them at one time. So they are available for you to book onto for free when you need them at your stage in development, and also when you have the capacity to do so. You know, if you're doing a big uh, pitch with a client one week, you might not need a, a comms uh, work it, workshop to be going on. So you can dip in and use them, and our team will guide you to them when you need them most. So you can tap into them uh, in a way that suits you. And finally, the heart of the programme, our coaching, which we think really sets us apart from most incubation or acceleration programmes out there. The heart of this are the entrepreneurs in residence that you'll hear from Rick a little bit later on what that role entails and everything involved in it. Um, close mentors that we will match with your founding team, usually from uh, a startup that's gone through a similar journey to you before or from a relevant industry. Then on the technical uh, advice areas, we have 15 organizations that offer advisors and residents, for example, law firms, accountants. We have an investor in residence in-house that will give safe space and formal advice be way before you're ready to raise. Again, you can book onto those um, almost on a weekly basis and the schedule when you need them to fill the gaps in your company. And finally, we have a wide range of panelists to join our business review panels. You can think of this as a semi-regular board before a board where you will have industry specialists in a board structure to answer the strategic questions of your business. Uh, and those are planned in when you're hitting strategic points in your business roadmap. And so all of that together effectively creates a portfolio of services that's curated for you and accessible by you when you need it most. And so it's by having all of that breadth and depth, but scheduled and worked to you individually as you need it, guided by your entrepreneur in residence that allows us to do such a rich and bespoke program. And for sure, we'll be happy to take any questions in a bit more detail on the content of that. So uh, what does it cost? Uh, for you. Uh, always an important point for every uh, any founder. So there is a cost to the membership. Full membership is £230 per month plus VAT. However, for early stage startups uh, in your first for your first year, we have uh, discounts available. And as mentioned, there is a range of different programmes uh, to make it more affordable and more accessible for people from different backgrounds uh, who are underrepresented in technology. As I mentioned, you don't have to have a space uh, in engine shed or in the building, but we do have uh, a range of options available uh, for you that can be packaged up, uh, both in engine shed, but also if you're from a life sciences background, need laboratories. We're partnered with the Quantum Technologies Innovation Center, just uh, right in the center of Bristol, who have laboratories and benches available. And a key point worth noting in the feedback coming out of the pandemic, we learned that startups were struggling with culture of uh, working together and taking space. So we do have an offer for new members in the programme that we have free co-working in the building for three months to help you get started, to help you build a team culture. And that's just some images of uh, what it looks like in uh, Engine Shed. So very final point for me. Uh, are you ready for um, Set Squared? And, and a different way of looking at it is it, are we the best people right now to give you the best support and help you to make the most of it? So we have six things that are worth thinking about. Firstly, are you a tech, uh, are you a tech focused business? So we tend to work with and look for companies that have technology at their core, particularly IP that's defensible because that's so critical when you're looking to scale uh, your company and raise funding in future. Secondly, our support tends to be a best fit for businesses that are established. By established, we don't mean that you need dozens of people and large investments, but that you are operating or ready to operate as a business. We aren't a great fit for companies that are for individuals at the very early idea stage, although we can give certainly give really good guidance and pointers for uh, ventures at that earlier stage. Thirdly, 
do you have an ambition to grow? And have you got some thinking of how you would grow? This doesn't just need to be financially, it could be in scale of impact in all kinds of ways, but do you have that ambition to scale the business with an understanding of how it could happen? In terms of money or funding, you definitely don't need to have all of your funding in place already. Our investor readiness program, that's all part of what we do uh, around helping you get ready for that. But we would expect at this stage, you would have an understanding of your business plan, understand the kind of funding you may need and what kind of areas it could come from to get you going. And finally, on the, the softer side, uh, more about you um, as a founder, we do tend to look for people that don't think they know it all. That may seem silly to say, but you know we're going to give the best help and support for you if you're up for learning, engaging, not just from us, but from your peers, from industry specialists on how to shape and grow your venture. And finally, we really are looking for businesses that want to find a home, want to be part of a community, and will be up for engaging and supporting their peers in the same way that we get support themselves. And that's a lovely segue that that is our friendly smiley team uh, where I think most of the people are on this call in the background and supporting in different ways but really we're here to help and as I said our underlying principle is to help founders succeed and on that point that's a natural segue that I'm going to hand over to our entrepreneur in residence Rick who's going to give a bit more of a deep insight into their role at the heart of the program. Thanks Marty. Um, I apologise in advance. I'm working off an iPad, so my head is at a very strange angle. Hopefully uh, that won't distract people too much. Um, so as Marty said, I'm one of four entrepreneurs in residence here at uh, Set Squared Bristol. And I just want to talk a little bit about what the role of uh, an EIR is. Effectively, we have all been where the founders of the businesses in Set Squared are. So my personal history, I've been through four startups, um, two hardware, two software startups. Um, and I've now moved more into a portfolio career, if you like. I started working at SetSquared 10 years ago. It's a part-time role, and that's very important. You don't need old advice that's 10 years out of date from me. I'm still working out there. I chair a couple of companies, I work with other startups in non-exec roles, et cetera. And that's true of all of the EIRs. We've been there, we've earned the battle scars, we've experienced the challenges that you are going to face on your journey. But the key is that the world changes, the markets change, technology changes, there are always new entrants, new competitions, new macroeconomic uh, challenges, new pandemics, dare I say. So the specifics of the challenge that you will face will be different. They will depend upon your tech, your customers, what is happening in the world in 2023 and 2024. So although I've maybe coached over a hundred companies, the generic problems are very similar. How do I find my first customers? The specifics of your circumstance mean that the advice I give has to be bespoke. That's what makes me really interested in doing this role. And it's that combination of the generic and the specific that is the bespoke element of the support that you will receive. Now, as an EIR, there are two things I have to achieve. I have to help your business grow, but I also have to help the founder grow or the founding team grow. And preferably at about the same rate because you will need to learn new skills. You will have new challenges, personally, uh, new things that you've not done before that your business now needs you to be able to do. So we focus as much on growing the business as on growing the founders. And sometimes that might mean hiring new people, expanding your team, maybe changing your own personal role within the company, moving up to board level, uh, which might be a new experience, or suddenly becoming the chief technical officer or stepping up to CEO if you were just a co-founder. So there's always these challenges and these changes that we will help you through. How do we do that? We have a number of tools, techniques, uh, and our own experience, of course. But fundamentally, what we're looking to do is build a trusted relationship with you. We will be the person that you can come to and talk about anything. Sometimes I describe myself as your harshest critic. So if you are looking at raising investment, for example, you're going to have the experience of going to investors and being cross-examined and sometimes quite harshly. 
well, before you get to that stage, I will cross-examine you. I'll prepare you for all of the questions you can anticipate and then help you to prepare the answers. And that's crucially part of the sport. So by the time you do go to an investor, you know what to expect. You're prepared for the type of questions that you will receive. And you know the kind of answers that an investor is looking to hear. So that can only work if we really have a trusted relationship between us. I will ask challenging questions. I'll ask stupid questions. But the, the process that we use, I describe as diagnosis, challenge and support. So I'll diagnose your problems. I'll work with you to expose the weaker areas of the business. You might already know what some of those are. You might know some areas where you need to personally up your skill set. And I will challenge you to do so. But crucially, I'm not just going to sit back then and say, get on, get better. I'm going to work with you, roll my sleeves up in our sessions and support you to develop those new skills or point you to workshops, point you to external experts, as Marty has mentioned, and make sure you connect with the wider program to acquire those skills, to obtain the support that you need. And as Marty said, there's no fixed duration to this program. In fact, the longest company, which was a medical devices company, so you can imagine all the regulatory hurdles, was with us for 14 years. Now, during that 14 years, they didn't see their EIR every week. There's a natural ebb and flow to the support requirements. So when you need a lot of support, you can talk to us frequently. If you don't need very much support at the moment, we will leave you to get on with growing the company. It really depends upon where you are in your journey. Um, so we're here for the long haul and the pace changes. The nature of our interactions will change. I've mentioned sometimes I will be challenging. Sometimes the meeting may be a tough meeting because you need to be held to account. I'll act almost as a policeman. Maybe I'll set you homework and check that it's being done because I anticipate you're gonna have that challenge in the marketplace and I want you to be ready before the challenge actually hits. Sometimes it might be a relatively soft session. It's talking about personal growth. Sometimes it might be a therapy session. And whilst I would never claim to be a qualified therapist, sometimes founders just need somebody to talk to. And as I say, it's about being a trusted friend, about being able to confront any challenge that you have in growing yourself or your company. Now, I don't want to get dropped uh, into too much vocabulary. There is technically a difference in coaching and mentoring and supporting and therapy and friendship. The fact is, as EIR, we're probably your primary contact with the program. And in different meetings, I'll be some or all of those things and I'll wear different hats as required. And sometimes you will ask me, can we have a mentoring session? Can we have a more hands-on coaching session? Can I just have an hour to chat? Because I'm feeling a bit of stress at the moment. So all of those areas are covered by the role. As your company grows, you go through fairly defined transitions. The first thing is establishing product market fit. You know where your customers are. Are you sure you're building what they want, et cetera? But then there'll be a phase of team growth, making sure your financial plan is solid and you know how much investment you need and where the sources of funding can be. Is that equity investment? Is that grant, et cetera? Are you ready for growth? Is your intellectual property defensible? And IP is, is a very broad topic from patentable science to your copyright and your trademark. Do you have freedom to operate? Is the IP that you have protected sufficiently that nobody else with a big budget can say, oh, that's good, I'll copy that and steal their market? Huge subject, and we can guide you through some of the, the minefields associated with intellectual property. But it might also be, a very specific skill. You're about to negotiate your first big contract. You're about to deal with a Japanese customer for the first time. And someone within our network, it might be me, it might be one of my colleagues or one of our mentors, will have some direct experience that you can tap into and learn from. So we are part of that wider connectivity. I sometimes describe myself as a GP. Um, like a GP, you can turn up, you can have a one hour session, and you can talk about any business related ailment. Because of my training, because of my experience and background, I'll probably be able to help you. I'll diagnose, try and work out what it is and what we can do about it. 
But I am supported in my role by the specialist, by the lawyer in residence, the accountant in residence, the journalist in residence, the marketing expert in residence, the uh, chief technical officer in residence. We have all of these expertise uh, within the programme and, of course, the wider ecosystem. There are a lot of companies that we deal with on specific topics. So if the GP can't help you, the GP refers you to the specialist. And then we will make sure, rather than just say you need to go see the lawyer, these are the questions you might want to ask the lawyer. This is how you might uh, run that session with the lawyer to make sure you're getting the best value out of that time that you uh, have available within the program. Um, so that wider network makes me more effective in my role. As I said, I've been through a number of startups myself, so I've got a certain amount of experience. And the thing that I'll leave on is the best experience I've ever garnered is when things have not gone well. I was very fortunate that through my startup experience, I had a small mentorship network. I had two or three people I could lean on who'd been there a couple of years ahead or a company ahead of me. Uh, and they were able to pick me up when I was down. They were able to advise me. They were able to help me when it was good that I wasn't running too fast and forgetting things that needed to be put in place. Marty mentioned that the coaching, the whole support network that we have within Set Squared is a key differentiator. I still firmly believe that. For the companies that have been through this is a key part of what we can offer that is different to a quick accelerator, to a quick um, incubation sprint program, for example. We have four EIRs, we all have different experience. You'll be allocated to one of us for simple capacity management, but it might well be that we cross refer. A bit like if you're seeing a GP, maybe your GP is on holiday and you need to see the locum. So we will also help each other out. Our experiences are different and you have access to all of that. That's a very quick overview of my definition, I guess, of, of my job. And the beautiful thing is it changes. It changes almost every day I'm in Engine Shed. It changes on a weekly basis. Uh, last Friday, the Chancellor announced new rules around SEIS investment and I'm having to learn new rules. That's great for me, um, but it's also great for you. It keeps me fresh, keeps the advice I give companies fresh, and those challenges, that learning becomes part of the community and everyone benefits from it. Right, I know we've been having a few questions come in on the chat. Uh, we will be having a Q&A session at the end and we will pick some of those questions up. Uh, it's quite hard for me to kind of read and think and talk at the same time. Uh, but we will pick those questions up in Q&A at the end uh, until time runs out. What I'd like to do now, however, is invite you to someone who's been the other side of the fence. Um, somebody I first met, I think, from my notes back in May 2016. Uh, Will is the CEO of Autonomy and has been through this programme as a founder. I haven't caught up with Will myself for about a year now, so I'm intrigued to find out where his journey has taken it. Mm -hmm. Will, over to you. Hello. Uh, can, everyone, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. So, um, yeah, I guess for Set Squared, uh, so, so I'm a sole founder. So um, before, I, before I kind of founded uh, Autonomy, I, I was uh, previously kind of a, a teacher for um, people with learning disabilities. Um, I did that for about five, five, six years. And, um, and I was then, then I was also assistive technology specialist. And prior to that, I, I did video production. So, so autonomy is a solution. I won't go too much into it. It's essentially just a combination of uh, video production um, and using video to help people with learned disabilities kind of overcome barriers and 21st technology on a smart device. And, and, and so um, in, in essence, what we do is we, we have an application, we provide video content, um, through that application that helps the person with a learned disability overcome whatever their barriers are in life at that time. And those barriers could be in the home around cooking, cleaning. It could be an employment around getting a job, understanding a CV, uh, reading their pay slip and all that kind of stuff. So um, when I when I started uh, at, at Set Squared, um, so, I, so I, I, uh, my background has always been kind of being in the public sector and, um, and obviously video production. So I didn't, I wasn't, you know, this is definitely my first uh, startup um and uh i i was essentially doing autonomy or kind of 
building the kind of MVP for autonomy. Um, and I was part-time teaching, part-time autonomy. And, and I actually uh, fortunately saw in a footer of another company in our space that they were part of like Set Squared Exeter. And I clicked on the link and then I noticed that um, there was a was, there was help in, in Bristol, basically. So I kind of submitted submitted through that. Um, I'd already kind of gone to get some help um, through North Somerset, which is kind of where I was, but I, the help wasn't what I was looking for. It was, uh, you know, it, the North Somerset landscape is less kind of scalable tech kind of thing. Um, and I was looking for something re much different. Uh, but um, yeah, so so I kind of submitted that and um, I, I met both um, Rick at the time and, and Grev, they kind of, so Grev was I now retired, but another EIR um, similar to Rick. Um, and I kind of sat down with them and I was talking about the innovation and kind of my vision and what I want to do with it. Um, and that was a really interesting meeting. I was very fortunate enough. Um, both of them said, you know, you could you can join the program and we can help you. And um, for me, uh, it's probably probably one of the best decisions that I've made as, as, as a founder. I essentially went into kind of uh, what I had was I knew how to create a product for people with learned disabilities that a great, a good, and what a good service looks like. I didn't know anything about how to turn that into a business. So I didn't, I'd never, I, I actually had paying customers, but I didn't have a business plan. I didn't have a marketing strategy. I didn't even know what a board was. I had like the company at the time was, was one share and that was me. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I got loads of really good support around um, how to create a marketing plan, how to, um, uh, build a board, how to understand, um, you know, your value, your USP in the market, where to position yourselves, where I want to be now, where I want to be later. It, it, Rick talks a lot about um, thinking really carefully about yourself. So a lot of the exercises was looking at my my strengths and my weaknesses. So kind of I was very happy probably through my teaching background, standing in a kind of a, a room full of people and doing kind of an elevatory pitch. What I was awful at was doing an Innovate UK application and going into spreadsheets and details and accountancy stuff that's never excited me so that one of our first hires was was someone in the industry that i knew and she loves stuff like that she couldn't think of anything worse than standing in front of a room and pitching but she she loves kind of the stuff i don't love so it's really kind of like that yin and yang kind of trying to trying to recruit accordingly um but yeah so so i mean free set squared um i just became more clearer on uh how to um get the business to where I wanted to, the trajectory of how to do that, um, that I'd actually need to raise some finance to, to get there, um, that uh, how, to, how, to, how to grow the team um, and uh, yeah, really benefit from the mentoring sessions, probably quite a lot more than I thought because being a sole founder is, um, is actually quite lonely in, in, in hindsight. Um, I don't really have a co-founder to kind of um, cry on and I'm, I'm, uh, I wouldn't, <laughs> I'm not really going to burden my wife with a lot of the... Uh, challenges that, that come up so I, I really do actually like talking in just kind of networking circles to other people with similar challenges um so yeah so and I kind of I guess where we we are now as an organization um I'd be fortunate enough to raise about a million pounds over three rounds um we actually met our uh, first investors through an event that was uh, hosted by uh by Tech Square Bristol um and uh Yes, we raised some investment there. We've had we've recently had um, some social impact funds invest in us. Um, we've got two programs. Um, we've got the technology that's on the market. We've got like paying customers. Got a team of twelve or thirteen people now. We're recruiting two more at the moment. Um, yeah, and we've got about four five hundred people across the country that use autonomy. Got a much clearer idea of of our um, our vision uh clear idea of how to communicate that to the team um and it's just kind of like how you know getting there and we're kind of going into that phase now of more scale-up challenges than kind of startup challenges um so it's stuff like processes and structures and all that kind of lovely fun stuff that to be honest is 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 interesting but uh, i know there's other people and like rick alluded to in, in his talk is is being hyper aware of probably when it's time for you to take a different role or step back or maybe this is not the bit that you find most fun um so i mean I've, i'm really enjoying it at the moment but it's, it's constantly kind of reflecting on that a bit is you know when when is what's the best interest of the company is there someone else better than me that could potentially do this role 
um there is probably and uh when when is the best time to hire them when can we afford it and all that kind of stuff and where where, where do i sit um i remember uh really a couple of poignant um times in set square one of them in particular was a workshop about um how to how to build a board and that was actually hosted by uh by nick at the time um and i just remember sitting in this workshop and um and it was they they there was like three different types of of um businesses right and there was you know really scalable business that you took a step back from there was like a lifestyle business and 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 this other style business and i i just remember thinking um it was it was there was like a in that workshop there was a big realization that i've always wanted to create something really good for like the the kind of industry that i worked in and and was really kind of passionate about um but it needed to be like not me it needs to be self-sustaining it needs to be this big thing that was kind of nationwide that people could rely on and it didn't it wasn't it definitely wasn't a lifestyle business for me it was like to to get to the vision it made me realize that i actually need to raise investment i actually need to get a load of people in and it's like that really early kind of realization that made me kind of think how how do i how do i structure doing that in in an actual way that like a strategy i can roughly follow um so yeah, so there's loads of really good um, coaching. Greb did a lot of good coaching around elevator pitches and stuff like that. So um, oh, yeah, I found it really, really useful. Hands down, one of the best decisions that I made was to kind of get in and get in an incubator like Set Squared. And I have been in an, an accelerator as well, and I've certainly found they're quite quick and short term. Whereas the incubator, you kind of had the ability um, with Set Squared to kind of lean on Rick and Greb when, when I needed to and turn up to all the workshops. I've also, you know, since we started hiring staff and a number of my staff go to the other workshops because I just think it'd be really beneficial for their roles. We go to a lot of the networking events. Um, yeah, I find it really useful. I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, but yeah. Cool, thanks, Well, Really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights with everyone. Um, I think now we're going to go to a Q&A. So as if by magic, a few more heads should appear beside us on the screen. Um, also introducing our fantastic programme manager, um, Kimberly Brook, who actually makes an awful lot of the programme work and is going to um, help run us through this Q&A session as well. Thanks so for the introduction, Marty. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, please do add in your Q&A into the chat box. I see there's quite a few questions already, so we'll just dive straight in if that's OK. Um, the first question is for Rick, which is about um, how do you define the successes that you've had in your previous businesses? Oh, great question. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant because the, the first answer a lot of people either want is, you know, how much money did you make? um what were the takeaways i think there's two things that i'll say um trying to it's probably a humble brag um i don't need to work i work because i love it and because i want to give back to the community and that's been the situation uh, since an early startup that i did but startups are addictive it's the most fun I've ever had in my career. I started off with 12 years in the corporate world. And whilst that was great and it paid for business class flights and all that kind of thing, it also made me very fat. Um, the startups are where I have found joy. So the success that I've had, I actually define by having since 2001, I've defined my whole career by working in and with startups. And uh, that's not going to change until I retire, if I retire. The real success is, do you enjoy your life? And I love it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm gonna jump down a couple of questions to one, which is about how do we kind of expect founders to commit to the program? Is it full-time, is it part-time? And how do we find a balance between needing to give them the time to earn money alongside starting their business? So I'm firstly gonna ask Marty if you can just fill on, in on that one, but then I thought it'd be great if Will can jump in and talk about his kind of starting and how he started in the business. So Marty, you first, please. Sure. I, and, you know, I think I didn't see who asked the question, but I think you've hit a real, you know, an amazing challenge right on the head in terms of a, an issue that a lot of founders face. I think unless you're fortunate enough and some are to have some pile of cash behind you already, it is a tricky balance, particularly in the early stages. And we do often work with founders in the early stage trying to juggle often consultancy. Um, 
or that has come out of a previous career with uh, getting uh, their venture off the ground to the point that they can attract funding. So it, it might be a bit of a sitting on the fence answer to say it is a little bit different for everyone because everyone is able to attract funding in different ways sooner rather than later. I think we're realistic that you know people need to balance those two things, need to balance generating funds elsewhere, particularly in the early stages. But I think when we're working with companies and, and Rick will be able to elaborate on this a little from all his experience of working with founders, we would be looking for and look for the expectation and the ambition to move over full time because it's it's a challenge and a dangerous thing to be running for a length of time with a, a venture balancing it um, and then maybe miss out on the ambition in the first place. But I think we are realistic and one of the real common things that comes up is helping founders make those decision points or think on those decision points. Like what yeah. do you, Will? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think uh, I think you're right. It's really um... It is challenging, right? Uh, and the way I did it, and it doesn't work for everyone, is um, yeah, we had uh, uh, some like I I did have some paying customers at the time that were essentially just buying like my MVP. But um, I remember even my self assessment tax return. I think I uh, I was maybe six seven thousand pounds was my self assessment tax return that year. So it wasn't a significant amount of money. So I I was kind of just kind of scraping by and. Um, I, I to be yeah to be brutal, I couldn't um, do, do the kind of uh, fee for for Set Square, but I was really fortunate enough that there was this program and Set Square had sponsored it at the time, and it was a kind of a health and social care IoT program that ran across the country, and the winners got six months free for Set Square, and I'd just been for my interview with Rick and Grave, and coincidentally I'd been on this program, and I was very lucky. I won the Southwest one. And I got the six months for free. So basically, the way I saw it was like, I've only got six months um, before I'm going to start getting invoices that I can't pay from this like incubator. And I'm just going to attend everything because I don't know anything. I really came in as a blank slate. And it was very much like I went to about three workshops a week as they would come up. So I was like in the engine shed all the time. And I was very fortunate by the time actually that six months was up. I'd actually got a bit more business through the business. So I was able to actually continue to pay my membership. But it, yeah, I mean, behind this, behind the curtain, there's that kind of your own financial situation and the struggle that you might have to, and I understand that other people might have um, struggles with, with uh, you know, my wife was working full time. So yeah, we were struggling at home, but at the same time, you know, there it wasn't like I was um, on my own or anything, yeah. I think that leads on to a question that I'd pre-preferred, which was about how companies might fund themselves during the early stage of the business and what might be available to them. Rick, would you be able to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, there are um, there are grants available. There are lots of programmes. One of the challenges in the grant landscape is there are different programmes almost every three months and they all have different rules. Some of them are 100% funding, some of them are 30% funding and you've got to find the rest. It is an ever-changing landscape, but part of our job within the Set Squared community is to understand that landscape and stay current. So if companies come in and they say we have a funding challenge, we can hopefully point them to several sources of funding. Now, there's no guarantee they will win that. Um, will mentioned one of the first things that, that he sought advice on was helping him in bid writing to have a better chance of winning those funds. And a lot of those funds are oversubscribed three or four mm. times the number of companies that can actually be backed. Yeah. But with our support, hopefully you'll be maybe not in the top quarter, in the top half, and you've still got to add your own expertise to win those grants. But just finding those grants is tough. There are some great facilities like the West of England Growth Hub, which I recommend everyone looks at. But all of these directors of grants have to stay up to date. And a lot of that we learn through networking. And Set Squared's fortunate in the engine shed to be at the hub of one of the strongest networks in the UK, actually. So we do tend to hear about these programs. I wouldn't recommend this, but I was certainly like getting a credit card and just slowly buying home food shopping. And then once that credit card was maxed out, I get another credit card and do the same thing. Um, don't take that as my advice, but I still even though i had some advice around the bid writing i still continue to be awful at it <laughs> we only started winning bids when i started recruit, recruiting people that actually know what they're doing but um definitely don't take that advice there's 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 better pots of capital available but 
in my naive state before I actually joined Step Squared, I didn't know of any better. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks. Um, yeah, so just following on from that as well. So there's a, a great question about kind of our focus on inclusive entrepreneurship. I'm going to lead that into Marty and about the kind of how we manage that and also the potentially talking about some of the, the kind of support that might be available financially for people as well. Sure. Yeah. And that's a great question. Um, and I just need to describe a quick distinction and because I think that the question mentioned the top 50 and 15 and there's a difference across there's the whole partnership network that I mentioned across the you know the southwest and down the south of England relative to Set Squared in Bristol. I think that list, and I'm glad you pointed it out because I'm going to raise that at the partnership level, is not particularly representative. But to give you the story, because I briefly touched on it in, in my talk, about five, six years ago, and it was before my time, so I can't take all the, the credit for the interventions that have come since, but I think there was a real hard look at what Set Square Bristol was turning into and what it was contributing to in terms of the risk of a very successful tech program could worsen inclusivity if not done properly. And at that time, research was carried out and it was broadly representative of the tech sector at large, which at the time, horrendous statistics of, you know, single digit percentages of women, vast underrepresentation of people of all kinds of different um, ethnic backgrounds. Um, so since then, year on year, there has been extensive research into the barriers and why there wasn't pipeline of people from different minority ethnic backgrounds, um, particularly also in gender into the program. So the, the two things, two the main two main programs that resulted out of that. One, uh, the breakthrough bursary. So this is funded by our alumni. Um, which gives a significant discount uh, for the first year of membership of the program for people from minority ethnic backgrounds. Uh, we built on that and we're now looking at putting funding into supporting and engaging uh, those members once they join the program to check there's not more barriers. And we also roll that out and attract people to that by working with regional community organizations. So we learned also that we can't just shout about the program and say it's inclusive now. We work with organizations like the Black Southwest Network in uh, this part of the country, Ashley Community Housing um, and Babasa to make sure we understand and engage with local communities where diverse founders can come from. Um, and I guess an exciting thing for us in the last cohort of Enterprising Women, which is a flexible pre-incubation program, um, the best high quality incubation support that ends in the main program, but delivered in a flexible nature um, to, uh, for women entrepreneurs to make sure that you know, they can balance it with other demands or other challenges, the barriers that were identified. Um, 30 women have gone through that program and actually the intersectionality as in women who are also of color, of different backgrounds, of different socioeconomic backgrounds is incredible. And now in the program, although it's just progress, 24% uh, of the founders in the current program or companies in the current program are founded by people from minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, that's huge progress, but it is just progress. So we are really focused on it. Brilliant. Thanks, Marty. Um, there's a question here about um, how we do we draw upon the lean startup methodology from Silicon Valley. That's probably best for Rick to answer. Yeah, Eric Reese and his uh, his philosophy on lean startup. It's one of the philosophies, certainly. Um, some of the, the highlights of lean startup, for those who are not familiar with it, are basically engage with your customers as early and as often as possible. Make sure that your customer is central to how you are defining your product. I talked earlier about product market fit. That's absolutely based on, on lean startup these days. Uh, and the other key tenet of lean startup is when you change your mind, uh, what Eric calls a pivot, it's based on data, not on guesswork. Um, absolutely, those, those are fundamentals for me for any business growth. But what I would say is Lean Startup is one of the philosophies. Um, we had a company uh, that I worked with who were on Marty's earlier slide called um, uh, Immersive Labs. When they joined our program, their vision was very clearly they wanted to have a hyper growth strategy. They were targeting the US market. They had to align their investment path to US investors, not UK investors. And because we are a bespoke program, the advice we gave them was targeted to that vision that they wanted to achieve. And the people we brought in as advisors were familiar with working in a US environment rather than a UK investment environment. And although there's an awful lot of similarities, 
sometimes those subtle differences are what trip you up if you get that wrong. So lean startup, yes, but not exclusively by any means. Thanks, Rick. And then there's a question about facilitating and advising on partnerships. Um, yes, that's something that we do do. We can facilitate partnerships with other universities, other community groups, other startups, or also with industry as well. So that's something that we can support with. Um, I think we're running out of time. So just one last question is about what's the acceptance rate for applications and the options to support businesses that aren't quite ready. And I'm going to pass that over to Rick as well. Yeah, over the years, I mean, it, it varies depending upon kind of what's going on in the world and macroeconomic, but we've tended to take on, I guess, one in three, one in four businesses. But there's a, a very significant thing here that does not mean that three out of four businesses are bad. Marty alluded earlier that we are maybe not the right place for you at this stage in your journey. So quite often we've uh, refused a company and said, sorry, we're not the right place for you now. But if you do a little bit more growth, come back in six months. Or we said, actually, you're already ahead of where our program is focused. You should be talking to the Set Squared Scale Up program. So it's not necessarily that we are rejecting poor companies. We're signposting them to other resources. But on average, I would say it's probably one in three, one in four applications get straight into the program. It's a slightly higher number. One example I always use is Yellow Dog. Great company, great growth company. They failed to get in the first time and we interviewed them. It was Grev and I, no, it was Nick and I, I think, who interviewed them. And it was, we had some issues with trying to understand their business plan. And in a one hour interview, we realized so did they. They went away, <laughs> they did six months of homework, they reapplied and they were a shoe in because they sorted out those issues. They'd been and talked to customers back to lean startup rather than projecting what they thought customers would want. They asked customers and they changed their business plan, they got straight into the program on the second application. I think ultimately, if you are interested in setting up a business, no matter what stage you are, get in touch with us and we can direct you to the most appropriate resources or even to our application form if necessary. I'm going to pass back over to Marty to finish up. Thank you. Oh, thanks, everyone. That's a beautiful segue uh, as well to highlight um, a couple of uh, things we've mentioned. Uh, firstly, yeah, really to re-emphasise what Kim just said. If you're not sure, um, if you'd like to know more, please do get in touch. I think there's a couple of questions about connecting on LinkedIn. Please do so. Uh, me personally, if I'm a little bit slow to get back, I, I apologise, I will try, but uh, sometimes I'm a bit swamped on there, given the nature of what we do with so many companies. Um, but just do get in touch, ask and clarify. But one very near term opportunity, um, if you aren't sure, uh, if you think you've got an idea, you're not quite sure if you're ready yet, we have an event uh, next month called Idea to Pitch happening in Bristol. Um, please do uh, apply to attend. It's part of the Bristol Tech Festival uh, in this occasion, but we run it in a range of locations across Bristol pretty regularly, idea to pitch where you can hone your ideas as part of a group, develop and practice your elevator pitch. Um, and, and secondly, I mentioned the breakthrough bursary. So this is specifically designed to try and break down barriers for founders from minority ethnic background. Uh, successful applicants, it covers uh, 75, have 75 percent of their startup membership covered for 12 months, and they're still eligible for getting three months of free desk space uh, in Engine Shed here and get to join and be part of the community. Applications are open right now for that. You can find all the details on our website, so um, please uh, have a look and apply. And if you're not sure if this is you and you're eligible, again, just ask. This is all about us just being trying transparent and open and helping you find the support that you need. So finally, yeah, if you're interested, uh, you think it ticks the boxes, please apply. Uh, our team are so used to having applications at all different stages of readiness, fielding questions. And as we've emphasized, uh, the startup world is so interconnected that if we aren't quite the right place, then we'll make sure we try and connect you and find what is the right thing for you at this point in time. So with that, just thank you all for um, taking your time out to engage with us, uh, listen to us, and um, I hope this has been useful. Please follow up, and thanks again to our whole team and Will for supporting the session, and hopefully hear from many of you soon.